स्थापताय धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णा ते नम सुस्मृतिपुराणा आलय करुणाल नमा भगवत्द शंकर लोकशंक सो वी आर् डिस्कसिंग दिस् इंपॉर्टेंट बुक सिनोनस ब्रह्मसूत्र Uh, I should say it's called in English. We find Brahma Sutra as it is written because Brahma Sutra ni in Sanskrit. Uh, altogether, uh, there are five hundred fifty-five uh, sutras, and you find there are slight uh, div- uh, d- uh, variations in the in the way these sutras are calculated. You find different numbers according to different uh, scholars. But anyway, the standard. uh we uh, the commonly accepted view is that there are altogether 555 sutras now what is a sutra that may require some explanation it called sutram so uh there is a popular definition uh that is uh, uh, alpaksharam asadhigdam saravat bishuto mukham astobham anavadyam cha sutram sutra vido vidu according to scholars according to knowledgeable people this is the sutra what is sutra first of all alpaksara means only a few letters just a few letters there are some sutras which are not even in the form of a complete word for example in the vyagarana sutras of panini uh, uh, only two letters which explains uh the some of the intricacies of uh, vyakarana uh, especially in the interpretative uh, structure so uh, a sutra need not necessarily be a complete sentence or even a full word but mostly there will be one word at least mostly and there are some sutras which are quite long some which are very very short so you find uh, even those who have studied who already listen to yoga sutra classes you will know that so a sutra uh, cannot be really understood because it contains only few words or few letters but it it is loaded with meaning which can be expanded comprehensive expansion interpretation will be required and once you uh, once you study it you will have no doubt about it so most of our indian uh, philosophical systems belonging to the traditional or the rock school or the astika tradition will have some sutra uh, uh, origin i mean their most original the earliest the foundational uh, work is always in the form of sutras for example mimamsa sutras of jaimini we have this vedanta sutras of badrayana that we are discussing now again nyaya sutras of of, of, of gaudama and vaisheshika sutras of kanada uh, yoga sutras of patanjali sangya sutras of kapila like that of course uh, in the buddhist tradition there is Uh, not much of a sutra tradition sutra uh, practice but in uh, most of the uh, traditional or the rock systems of indian philosophy uh, will have the sutra foundation now uh, to give a short example you know if you look at the uh, different uh, vedanta systems of india all together you find uh, almost seven very distinct Uh, schools of vedanta we are not talking about indian systems of philosophy in general we are talking about only those systems of philosophy which are included in the vedanta category so just one of the six uh, uh, astika darshanas one of the six orthodox schools of philosophy so of course the most well known and naturally the most popular one is the tradition of shankaracharya it's called advaita so shankaracharya wrote a commentary in the 8th century he wrote a commentary for badrayana sutra called, which is supposed to be one of the masterpieces of a of a commentary on the sutra literature 
And then we have Ramanuja, who was another great scholar. Uh, he wrote uh, an interpretation of Badrayana Sutras uh, according to Visistha Advaita tradition. Uh, the Advaitins will tell you there is only one Nirguna Brahman, one ultimate reality, which is which transcends all attributes, characteristics, which is uh, which cannot be defined or explained, but can only be experienced as our own inner being, and that's the only ultimate absolute reality. Everything else is is uh, relative. Mithya means Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya means relative, changing impermanent in that sense. The second one, Ramanuja. Uh, Ramanuja believed uh, in three uh, system means that is uh, Sat, Chit, Chit, Achit, Achit, Brahman. So, it's a Saguna Brahman. Chit, Achit, Vishishta Brahman means Brahman conditioned by Chit, Achit. Chit is Chaitanya or the Achit, this uh, phenomenal world. The third one is uh, Nimbarka. Of course, the Nimbarka, Madhva, the uh, Ramanuja, they, they, are, uh, they, they are more or less belong to the same time within 200, 300 years. Nimbarka lived in the 12th or 13th century, Dvaita Advaita. And he also believed in this Chitta Chit. And then uh, Madhva, third, Madhva also was uh, was very popular in many parts of the south southern india dvaita actually chaitanya system is philosophically uh, indebted to do uh, madhva sampradaya they claim that this uh, madhva sampradaya is the heritage the, this, uh, the the spiritual heritage to which chaitanya tradition belongs so madhva uh, is called dvaita system i mean so and then there is a Vallabha, it's called Suddhadvaita. And there is then, of course, there is the system of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's Gaudiya Vaishnava. And Beladeva wrote a commentary according to Chaitanya school. And then, of course, there are other, you know, Bhaskaracharya wrote Bheda, Bheda. The Vijnana Bhikshu wrote another commentary. Then Shivadvaita, Sikandhacharya, and so on. So I'm not going to all those details so but it's very interesting to get an idea of this uh, of this uh, great tradition and then there are a number of other uh, uh, books written uh, more or less dealing with the subjects of brahma sutra uh, it's of academic interest i mean how vast it is so uh, to understand the uh, the fundamental authentic uh, philosophical literature of uh, just one of the several philosophical traditions of India, like Vedanta itself, requires uh, our lifelong dedication to study and contemplation. But just to give an example, I shall uh, just give a list of some of the well-known uh, works written on the topics related to Brahma Sutra. Altogether, there are 21. One is an Abhashyartha Nyaya Mala by Subramanya, Vayasika Nyaya Mala by Bharati Dirtha is well known, is well known, belonging to Sangheri tradition. Then Shastra Dattpana by Amalananda. Amalananda was actually a great writer belonging to the Bhamadi Prasthana, Bhamadi school of Vedanta. Then, of course, there is a Vedanta Nyaya Bhushana, Suyam Prakasha, Brahma Sutra Gurti, Haridikshida. Brahma Sutra Deepika by Shankarananda, Vedanta Sutra Muktavali Brahmananda, uh, Brahma Sutra Bhashyartha Sangraha by Brahmananda Yeti, Brahma Sutra Arth Deepika by Vengada, Brahma Sutra Vritti by Annam Bhatta, Brahma Sutra Bhashya Vyakya by Jnanottama Bhattaraga, Brahma Sutra Vritti by Dharmabha, then Sutra Bhashya Vyakhyanam by Advaitananda, Brahma Sutra Bhashi Vyakya by Nyaya Rakshamani. It's called Nyaya Rakshamani, is another uh, well known book written by a very famous scholar, Appaya Dikshida. He was one of the prominent writers uh, belonging to the Southern tradition, Southern school, South India. And Nyaya Rakshamani is a well known book for those who want to study the dialectical dimensions of Vedanta, belonging, again, belonging to the Bhamadi tradition.
ಬ್ರಹ್ಮತತ್ವ ಪ್ರಕಾಶಿಗ ಬೈ ಸದಾಶಿವೇಂದ್ರ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಸೂತ್ರ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಸೂತ್ರೋಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಬೈ ರಾಮೇಶ್ವರ ಭಾರತಿ ದೆನ್ ಶಾರೀರಿಕ ಮೀಮಾಂಸ ಸೂತ್ರ ಸಿದ್ಧಾಂತ ಕೌಮುದಿ ಬೈ ಸುಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ್ಯ ಅಗ್ನಿಚಿತ್ ಮುಖೇಂದ್ರ ದೆನ್ ವೇದಾಂತ ಕೌಸ್ತುಭ ಬೈ ಸೀತಾರಾಮ ಶಾರೀರಿಕ ನ್ಯಾಯ ಮಣಿಮಾಲ ಬೈ ಅನನ್ಯಾನುಭವಾನ್ ಶಾರೀರಿಕ ಮೀಮಾಂಸ ನ್ಯಾಯ ಸಂಗ್ರಹ ಬೈ ಪ್ರಕಾಶಾತ್ಮ ಶಾರೀರಿಕ ಮೀಮಾಂಸ ಸಂಗ್ರಹ ಅನ್ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಬುಕ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣಾನುಭೂತಿ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಟೈಟಲ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಗಿವ್ ಎನ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಹ್ಯೂಜ್ ಲಿಟ್ರೇಚರ್ ನೋ ಇಟ್ ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ಸ್ ಸೆವರಲ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಈವನ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಒನ್ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಬುಕ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅಡಿಷನ್ ಟು ದಟ್ ದರ್ ಆರ್ ಮೆನಿ ಮೆನಿ ಅದರ್ ಬುಕ್ಸ್ ನೋ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಟು ದ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಪ್ರಾಪರ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ಸೆವರಲ್ ಆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಬಟ್ ದೋಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಹೂ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ನೋ ಲಿಟ್ ಮೋರ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ಗ್ರೌಂಡ್ uh the evolution of this text uh, we do not know uh, uh, the exact time in which uh, uh, badrayana wrote this brahma sutras but we can safely assume that it must be uh, very old uh, because uh, one of the uh, important uh, uh, aspect to remember is the first well known the oldest and the most prominent uh, commentary on brahma sutras uh, even now is shankara's commentary belonging to 8th century ad now what is shankara acharya's place in indian philosophy i shall just give you example many of you know that these vedas were not studied by all hindus or by the whole indian society never in fact a large sections of indian society were not actually even permitted to study vedas unfortunately but gradually you know there was a revolt against this exclusivism and the first great revolutionary who rose against this exclusivism was lord krishna himself so if you read the bhagavad gita you find there are places where sri krishna himself talks about talks against or the doxy exclusivism and also the interpretation of the vedas by the ritualists who believed that the whole purpose of human life is to continue performing rituals just for one's own material prosperity material comfort yakshid so yakshid asyami modishe itya jnana vimohidaha ಅನೇಕ ಚಿತ್ತ ವಿಭ್ರಾಂತ ಯು ಫೈಂಡ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಡಮ್ ದೀಸ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಸೇ ಯಕ್ಷೆ ದಾಸ್ಯಾಮಿ ಮೋದಿ ಶೇ ಐ ಶಾಲ್ ಪರ್ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ರಿಚುವಲ್ಸ್ ಐ ಶಾಲ್ ಗಿವ್ ಎವ್ ಎ ಬಿಗ್ ಗಿಫ್ಟ್ಸ್ ದೆನ್ ಐ ಶಾಲ್ ಎಂಜಾಯ್ ಹೆವೆನ್ಲಿ ಕನ್ಫರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಹೆವೆನ್ ನೌ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಗೋಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸಚ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಆರ್ ಕಾಲ್ ಬೈ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಇದು ಅಜ್ಞಾನ ವಿಮೋಹಿದ ದೋಸ್ who are deluded by ignorance now historically speaking the first revolutionary who rose against this vedic exclusivism was lord buddha himself in the 6th century bc as a coincidence after buddha's passing away the teachings of buddhism themselves became a new denomination in the early days mostly in hindu scholars used to uh, flow into buddhist uh, faith but gradually it became a separate religion in course of time especially after the travel across the borders it got spread all over in asian continent it became a distinct religious tradition 1200 years 12 centuries later after buddha shankaracharya was born in the 8th century ad now during this 1200 years a lot of changes had happened 
Buddhism in India uh, became irrelevant. Not Buddha. Buddha was extolled to the status of an incarnation. But Buddhism as a separate distinct religious tradition lost its uh, relevance as a separate uh, denomination. Though Buddhism that spread outside India took the form of a definite distinct religious uh, school, religious tradition, within India Buddhism was absorbed into, into Vedantic tradition. This happened due to two great philosophers who belonged to the Mimamsa school and they were Kumari Labhatta and his junior contemporary Prabhakara. They both reclaimed the predominance of Buddha, uh, Vedas, Vedic heritage, which was actually questioned and repudiated by Buddhists. So there was this conflict between uh, Buddhists who did not accept the Vedas as a revolt against the exclusivism and, and on the one hand and Kumarila and Prabhagara who wanted to reclaim the dominance of Vedas. So it was successfully accomplished by Kumarila Bhatta and Prabhagara later on. But what they did was something very unfortunate. They emphasized the idea again and again that the only purpose of Vedas was to teach you rituals. They did not, uh, uh, they did not accept any higher transcendental, metaphysical uh, concept in Vedic heritage, Vedic literature. The whole purpose, the entire uh, purpose of the study of the Vedas, the only theme in Vedic literature was performance of rituals. And the purpose of these rituals, the performance of rituals was to attain heaven. Heaven after death, Surga Prapti. Surga Kamo Ejeda. Those who want to go to Surga, those who want to heaven, they should perform these rituals. Now, in 8th century, Shankaracharya arose. He said, no, you are wrong. Rituals are not the only purpose of Vedic literature. Not necessarily. Those who want to perform rituals, and as a result of performing rituals, those who want to go to heaven, those who want to please gods and goddesses, may obtain wealth, comforts, everything. But there are those who are not interested in going to heaven. There are those who are more evolved uh, specimens of humanity who tell you, well, I don't want this wealth. The wealth is not so very important. I want, I am looking for some higher meaning in life. Even I don't want to go to heaven. Hindu concept of heaven is not a permanent uh, state of liberation. It is just a transient, uh, momentary and impermanent status where you enjoy some comforts and you, then you are born again. So Shankaracharya said, there are many highly enlightened people who are not interested in the heavenly comforts. They want to get spiritual liberation. They want to understand and experience the ultimate purpose of human life and human existence. So he evolved this doctrine of Advaita. He did not deny the right of those who want to go to heaven to perform rituals. All right, if you want to go to heaven, okay, you do that. But don't tell me that everyone should do only these rituals. Don't tell me that that's the only meaning and that's the only essence of Vedic philosophy. So he said, this is Chittasya Shuddhaye Karma Natu Vastu Balabdhaye Vastu Siddhi Vijarena Na Kinjit Karma Godi Pihi. So he says, for example, 
you perform this ritual is called karma means rituals even if you continue performing rituals for hundreds of years thousands of years millions of years still you cannot attain the highest spiritual liberation for that you have to understand the true meaning of your existence the you should understand your true nature what is your essence are you just this body mind complex that wants to enjoy things of this world or are you something more than that this knowledge and this experience is the essence of vedic teachings and he said to attain this you need for disciplines so now in the brahma sutra if you i have already sent to some of you the first four sutras the first sutra as those of you have got it may remember you know the first sutra is adhado brahma jignasa atha ataha brahma jignasa now onwards therefore we shall make an enquiry into brahman this meaning here gold jignasa adhikaranam the particular adhikarana adhikarana is a small unit of brahma sutras a number of a number of uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, a number of uh, sutras will be included in one adhikarana so adhikarana is just one unit so what is the adhikarana adhikarana is essentially one part so visayo visayaschaiva purvapaksha stadotaram sangadish cheti panjangam shastri adhikaranam vidhu so there are certain elements one is a subject then some doubts regarding this and then there is a prima facie view which may not necessarily be correct and then an analysis and then there is an answer the conclusion this is the essence of adhikarana so what it essentially means is simple vishay so for so for example vishaya vishaya means subject matter for example samanvaya adhikaranam jignasa adhikaranam etc jignasa adhikaranam means an adhikarana is only one sutra it deals with jignasa a desire to know so there is a there is a subject then vishaya vishaya is possible doubts and then sangadi is a pertinent relevance of connection between the specific upanishadic statements which is which is mentioned there and of course i mean i mean the chapters and the particular pada now here i must tell you at the very beginning in brahma sutras you find the other codes various sentences various po- uh, uh, various portions from the upanishad literature that is which is called nyaya prasthanam logically analyzing the meaning the important statements of the upanishad upanishad portion of the vedas upanishads constitute the philosophical part of vedic literature so there will be long quotations from chandogya upanishad taittiriya upanishad brihadaranya upanishad and different upanishads so these upanishad statements are quoted and they are logically analyzed and then a conclusion is made on the basis of this so shankaracharya will tell you all the upanishads together tell you that existence is one there is only one supreme reality everything else is 
relative or changing entities. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. And Ramanuja Acharya will tell you, for example, the same Saguna Ishara, God with attributes and characteristics, exists in all of us. That's that supreme God is Saguna Brahman. Mehe Vasudeva or Narayana, you call Vaishnava tradition. He has many attributes. Sagala Guna Kalyana Nidhi is a repository of all good qualities or auspicious qualities. More or less, Madhva follows the same tradition. Madhva, Nimbarka, Baladeva, Chaitanya. More or less, you find no, in non Advaitic interpretations of Brahma Sutras, there are many things which are very similar. They are basic, they are fundamentally, in, if you use the English language, they are monotheistic in nature. Purva Paksha is something very interesting. So you are going to do something very interesting, Purva Paksha. Purva Paksha literally means prima facie view. I mean, when you read something, well, and a, a soup, I mean, uh, let's say just one reading, and the first impression, this is the meaning. But then the, the discussion begins. Somebody else, no, no, it's not like that. It could be have another meaning. What is the correct meaning? Then discussion follows. So there will be an argument and heated debates and arguments between the person who has this Purva Paksha view. Purva Paksha view literally means what the impression that you get, the earlier impression, the first impression, before you actually get the correct impression. So that indication. The correct impression is Siddhanta Paksha, I mean the conclusion, the real correct interpretation. The conclusion of uh, Shankaracharya's commentary will be Advaita. The conclusion of Ramanuja's commentary will be a conclusion based on Visistha Advaita, which is Ramanuja's philosophy. The conclusion of Madhvacharya will be naturally a conclusion based on the Dvaita, the dualistic interpretation of the scriptures. So that is Siddhanta. Here, so, Purva Paksha, this is a very important aspect. There are also some funny episodes that, that are very interesting. For example, well, I can just give an example. I can be very, philosophy can be very entertaining. That's something, if you read uh, some of the Vedantic literature, highly dialectical but there's also a little bit of humor and fun about it. In Bhamadi, for example, Bhamadi was written by a great, outstanding, unforgettable person in India's philosophical tradition. He was an householder, an old man. He had already started writing a commentary on Brahma Sutras. Brahma Sutra, he was a, writing a commentary on Shankaracharya's commentary on Brahma Sutras. It's called Bhamadi. He lived almost uh, within 100 years of Shankaracharya's passing away. So he was an elder contemporary according to some views. So the Vajaspadi, he actually lived in Mithila, uh, which, is, which is one of the cradle of the uh, Navyanyaya, an important branch of the Indian, logic, Indian tradition of logic, the tradition of Indian logic. So it originated in uh, in uh, Mithila, and Mithila is a place associated with the great Janaka, the philosopher king whom we read about in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Anyway, this Bhajaspati was a very great scholar who had written uh, books on many, many subjects. He was already married, but he had already started writing his commentary on Shankaracharya's commentary on the Brahma Sutras. But he didn't stop writing. He was so dedicated to writing that great book. It is one of the most marvelous dialectical works written uh, on Shankaracharya's Bhashyas. It is a long succession, you know. Bhamadi, then Bhamadi Kalpadaru, a commentary on that commentary, Kalpadaru Parimala, then that's a commentary on the other previous commentary. Like that, and it goes on, so successive commentary after commentary after commentary, fine. So this man had already started writing his book, 
and after marriage also he continued writing he never thought of living a worldly life for him philosophy was his life breath now the greatness is the greatness of his wife was that she did not disturb him she found her husband was writing a magnificent philosophical dialectical uh, magnum opus and she didn't want to disturb so she did every all the household work silently helped him served him and this man was immersed in philosophy and uh, it is a very interesting thing and at some stage after several years he was coming to the end of his work magnum opus one day one evening you know this before electricity in the 9th century ad and uh, he he found that some an old woman with a gray hair was pouring oil on the lamp under which he was writing this commentary in the late evening she looked at her and he recognized it was his wife and he then tears rolled down his eyes and she understood and he understood her greatness because she never disturbed her never brought him into worldly duties and responsibilities and he finished that book in a few days and he gave one name to that book that is that is the name of his wife bhamati so bhamadi became immortal by by him because when he gave this that name his wife name to the this unique work now that's a, that's one but there's something interesting aspect about this purva paksha siddhanta this prima facie view more or less in lawyer you know so it's a latin expression which means on the face of it first impression but it's something little more than that Uh, there will be a long discussion behind the statement of every prima facie view. So one good example, for example, in one of these books, you know, Brahma Jitnasudha Vyam Madhavana Jitnasudha Vyam. See, there may be some people who may argue, why should we make this inquiry into Brahman? After all, Adhado Brahma Jitnasa, there's a first sutra. So it's absolutely it doesn't seem to make sense because Brahman is everywhere. Sarvam khalu idam Brahma. Brahman is everywhere. And Brahma is sar. It is sarvavyapi. It means omnipresent, all-pervading. Why should you make an inquiry about it? This is a, a a funny objection. Of course, Brahman is everywhere, but that doesn't help us much because we think we are this. Uh, body mind complex nothing more so that uh, the fact that brahman is omnipresent we are all essentially brahman in nature that spiritual that intellectual idea may not be very helpful we have to realize it as a fact and for that we have to do a lot of spiritual practice spiritual discipline this is a fact and then uh, this this objector the one who raises this prima facie view he gives so many so many uh, i mean uh, uh, he raises so many arguments in defense of his objection which will be demolished by bajaspati now here it is the writer himself the writer himself is raising all these objections it's not that there are two warring groups which is conflicting with each other the writer the author himself is is raising so many objections against his own theory against his own thesis because he wants to get an opportunity to drive home his arguments if he unilaterally if he goes on explaining describing his view it will be very boring so in order to make the whole thing more profound he in his mind he 
raises so many different possible all kinds of conceivable objections against what he is going to establish in his book after raising all these objections then he begins to demolish all those objections and then he establishes his thesis so when i was teaching this uh long ago years ago decades ago so to speak somebody in the uh, i mean a small class with 10 or 12 people you know 12 uh, students one of them raised this question suppose you are uh, your your friend is walking in the street and you go to him look here if you hit me i shall hit you if you call me all these names and gives a long list of names that if you call me i shall give you this reply the other man says but i didn't call you any name so why should you why should you threaten me no no i did not say that you call me these names i'm telling you if you ever call me these names I, this is what this is the retort i'm going to give to you so i'm just giving an example it shows the on the way it looks a bit comical but the point is is on the one hand it's so profound how a single idea can be approached from so many different angles so many different mutually contradictory angles and how the idea can be analyzed thread by eventually to conclude a, a, a central idea and this is the i know uh, i can warn all of you it can be fairly boring but it will be intellectually very entertaining very rewarding because after all uh, you know a deep interest in higher philosophy maybe what we need in this modern age of uh, it technology and superficiality <laughs> and the consequent problems so if we can keep our mind engaged in some higher thoughts Uh, well if not this may be kind you can take critical purism of plato but in this there is one difference here eventually we be forced to think well what am i living for what's the purpose of human existence so i'll come to this first sutra again the first sutra is atha ataha brahma jignasa the jignasa adhikaranam I mean, desire to know. So, when do we develop a desire to know the higher transcendental truth? When we are ready for it. Unless our mind is ready for it, we won't have the desire to know what is beyond what we already know. Unless we know something, we won't have a desire to know what is beyond what we already know. now here there are two possible interpretations so i shall just read this adhikaranam abhicharyam va vicharyam va brahma abhyas nirupana asandeha abalatva abhyam na vicharam tad arkhadi adhyasoham buddhi siddhoha asangam brahma sudiri sudiridam sandeha mukti bhava cha vicharyam brahma vedatah anyway this is the adhikarana now i shall give a brief outline of what we are going to discuss uh, henceforth now onwards what does it mean i can remind you of the first sutra of yoga uh, yoga I mean atha yoga anushasana henceforth we can uh, inquire we are sorry we can discuss or we can instruct we can uh, begin a discussion we can uh, start an instruction on yoga that is yoga sutra adado dharma jignasa that is again in in jaimini sutra so but when do we actually think of in making an investigation an inquiry into the ultimate truth not after a lot of actions that's an important thing so some of the ritualistic philosophers will tell you you perform a lot of a number of rituals and you study 
all the uh, previous uh, branches of Vedas like Karmakanda and then you uh, study uh, you make an inquiry into the nature of Brahman now Shankaracharya says no because he says there are many people who study Vedas all the time and still they study the Vedas, they perform rituals and they ask for Dakshina, they make a lot of money, they also build big homes, big cars, maybe in modern times in a different way perhaps, but that doesn't necessarily make them to think of what lies beyond. You know, Najigeda's third bone, you have to remember. Najigeda's first bone that he asked in, in Kathopanishad. In Kathopanishad, Najigeda, the student, the small boy, he one day he discovered that his father was performing a ritual. And he was a very rich man, very prominent person. Now, one of the important items, one important item of the ritual was that he should give away whatever he possesses, whatever property he possesses. So in those days, cows were, cows were an important uh, part of wealth and property. So he was giving away all uh, worthless cows, old cows, cows that you cannot uh, eat grass, cows that will not give milk any longer, cow, cows that which cannot drink water. Pidodaga, Jagdaduna, Dugdadoga, Nirindriya, the Kadhovanish says. This is a meaning. So the boy approached his father. Father, uh, the, the real, the most important part of the ritual is you should give your most uh, precious wealth to those who are in need of that. I am your eldest son. I do, to whom are you going to give me? Little boy innocently he asked this, and father got angry when he repeated again and again, Dithiyam, Tridiyam, Sahovaja. Twice, three times he asked. Then father retorted angrily, Murtivetuam Dudamidi, I'm going to give you to the Lord of Death. You get lost, that could be the modern equivalent in modern English. And the boy wanted to make his word, father's words come true and he started his journey to the Lord of Death, Yama. Yama was not there. So he came only after three days. So three, for three days the little boy waited for Yama in his place, palace. So Yama as a compensation asked him, well you can ask for three bones. The first bone that the boy is asking is, it corresponds to our needs in this empirical world. Wealth, job, security, insurance, car, house, bank balance, all that. Shanda Sangalpa Sumana Ida Sya Vida Manyu Gautu Mama Abhimutyu Tupra System Abhyode Prasida Eda Trayanam Prathamam Varambrani. The first bone is my father should speak to me presently. He should not be angry with me. And uh, uh, by, impl by, uh, by implication, he was asking for material prosperity, ha happy family life. Then he found, well, that won't last for long. Then he asked for the second boon. The second boon that he asked for was, after death, I should be able to go to heaven and there I should be able to enjoy all the wonderful things of heaven. The second boon is, you should teach me a Vedic ritual by performing which I can go to heaven because they I can do for a long time like the late angels they was second point so that's a view of the Mimamsakas perform work hard be efficient make a lot of money and study Vedas perform rituals again study the Vedas perform rituals make more money so you don't actually move one inch forward in this mass, in this process so Nachiketa asked for the third boon. Third boon is AM Prede Vijigitsa Manushi Asti Tiege Nayam Asti Dijayegi Edad Vidyam Anusishtas Toyaham Varanam Esha Varastradiyaka. 
Some people say death is the end of everything. Some people say no, death is only a coma, a semicolon. Some people say something remains even after death. Some people say nothing remains. You should teach me the real nature or this absolute truth. What happens to a person when he dies? Is there something eternal, immortal, permanent, everlasting that you teach me? So Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of the supreme reality and how to attain that. So Yama go, goes on describing this. Now, this Natsigeda, he was not a Vedic scholar. He was not a ritualist. But when he realized one after another, when he thought about these two boons, he understood, well, this is not going to last long. So, I should look for the highest supreme value in life. So, Shankaracharya says, Atha means, when you reach a level of supreme spiritual wisdom called Mumukshuttu means a desire for spiritual liberation. And he says there are seven characteristics which describe this urge, this supreme, uh, supreme desire for the highest spiritual emancipation, enlightenment. It is called sadhana, chadushtaya, sampatti and sravanam, maranam, nididhyasanam in technical Sanskrit language. Means you should have a, a sense of what is eternal, what is of eternal value and what is of non-eternal value. So, uh, nitya, anitya, vastu, viveka. What is nitya, eternal? What is anitya, non-eternal? And then, Iha Mutra Phala Bhoga Vidaka. So you should also realize that all the enjoyments in this world and in heaven, they are all temporal, they are transient, they are non-eternal. So you should have a sense of renunciation of all these worldly things. The third is Samadhi Sarka Sambhat. Samadhama, Thidiksha, Uvaradi, Samadhanam, etc. So, you should have this Samadhi Sarka Sambhati. And then, uh, Mumukshutvam, I mean, a strong desire for spiritual enlightenment. So, the point is, uh, this cannot come for everyone. Just because you already performed a lot of rituals or you already had enjoyed a lot of wealth and again it is not necessary for you to enjoy all the worldly things to feel a total sense of renunciation. It can happen any time. Sometimes children become great philosophers. Sometimes very old uh, rich, big uh, persons, they are not even as wise as young boys. So you can find this in the spiritual sense, not in academic sense. So the point is, Atha means, now onwards, when you are already fed up with, not because you have gone through every little bit of enjoyments, but you already have an inborn sense of spiritual wisdom, spiritual uh, level-headedness to understand the ephemeral, the impermanent, the transient nature of all the worldly things. Oh, I won't care for this. That's the stage when you begin your inquiry into Brahman. Like Nanjiketa. Nanjiketa was not an old man, very young boy. And then what you do, then you may take, go to library, read a book. It may be something that takes you beyond this world. It may be something that reinforces your sense of renunciation, your sense of spiritual wisdom. It may reinforce your uh, full conviction. Well, these things, these worldly things won't last for long. So there is no point in chasing these worldly enjoyments. 
After all, you go on enjoying, then you become rich, you become old, you enjoy and suffer, and you you die, you are reborn again, again the same, the same cycle begins, it goes on rotating without uh, moving one inch forward in a, in the evolution of our life. So what's the use of it? So even before going through all this, if you can feel the sense of renunciation, then you can start your inquiry into Brahman. So Sravana means reading scriptures. Manana means thinking over this. Mananam, thinking over this. And Nididhyasana means being fully immersed, internalizing what you have read and what you have contemplated upon. So when this happens, therefore, then you should look for some higher meaning in life. That is the real meaning of the first sutra. Now Shankaracharya in his commentary, he brings in a whole lot of philosophy of adhyasa, it is called, you know, superimposition. Very often in our life, we superimpose the real on the unreal and the unreal on the real. I shall, I shall read and explain later. For example, uh, a, 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 the, you have seen silver, you have a lot of silver, plate, silver uh, ornaments in your home, so you know silver is shining. So when you see something that is very, very shining, resembling silver, maybe you may see uh, uh, what do you call it, a mother of pearl or some uh, cone shell or some creatures spread on the sand in a seashore, a river shore. You may see some um, shining outer shells of some creatures of cones or mother of pearl, what they call it. And from a distance you may mistake, oh, it's a piece of silver lying on the sand. So, because the quality of silver, the shining, that you already know. So, when you see something which is shining, so what you do? You superimpose a silver on something because of its resemblance. So, because of memory, smriti ruba means intended for memory. So, superimpose something. Like that, what do we do? We superimpose the absolute reality, the Brahman, in our own internal mechanisms, which are always changing, always moving, always in a flux. Our thoughts, our emotions and feelings, all these are changing all the time. So when I say, well, I, I was happy, when you, you just eat the chocolate, you say, I'm happy. Who am I happy? I, the Atman. Atman cannot be happy like that by eating chocolates. What you, what, when you mean, when I use the word, when you use the word I, you don't mean Atman, which is your true nature. You're talking about your own body, mind complex. Happy and happy and so on. So what we normally do, we superimpose silver on the mother of pearl, on the corn shell. Like that, we superimpose Atman in our ego, in our intellect, in our emotions, in our mind. And we also superimpose all this on Atman. So anyway, this is an interesting subject, Adhyasa, it is called superimposition. And we will discuss that later. It is an important theme in Vedantic literature. Actually, when, you, when we read this Vedanta, you need no, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't have to go through the entire karma kanda and then uh, come to this conclusion. The mo when we read of, when we read some higher thing in a book, if you feel well, this is something wonderful. It means we are in a state of um, intellectual fitness to understand the true meaning of it. If we are not ready for it intellectually, we won't be able to grasp its meaning. In spiritual life, the conviction that all these things in this world are only 
transient, impermanent things. We should look for some higher meaning in life, for that we should look higher than what we see around. So that comes as a result of spiritual fitness. So spiritual fitness comes only when we attain this sadhana, sadushtaya, sampatti. I mean, that means attaining the four important qualifications. First of all, a sense of what is real, what is unreal. Intellectually or emotionally, we may one day we may feel, oh, all these things are okay. But then next moment, all will come back. It can happen. But when we think over, again and again, we find the Vedantic idea that everything in this empirical world, including wealth and status and money and health and all these things, are necessary for you to live in this world, but don't ever think that they are going to be there all the time. And that Vedantic truth can become a kind of spiritual common sense. That's why the highest philosophy need not be dry. It is linked to our everyday life. It's not like reading Critic of Pure Reason. Or modern, I'm, please don't mind, modern philosophers, they don't always link what they're talking about, their doctrines, to our real life. If this if Vedanta actually serves one practical purpose, it is this. It makes us, uh, it enables us to make use of the doctrine of the relativity of all empirical things uh, as, a, uh, as a kind of spiritual common sense, intellectual common sense, kind of intellectual level-headedness. So that's an important uh, part, important um, aspect of the Vedantic studies. Never, we should never mistake that Vedanta is some dry, dialectical, uh, metaphysical system which has nothing to do with our life. Advaita Vedanta will make every person to look at his own life and look at everything from a more mature, more level-headed perspective. That's the real purpose of Vedanta. Now you can ask questions. I will come back to the subject again in a more academic style from next class onwards. This is just a brief introduction of the first sutra. You can ask questions. Yeah. Uh, first, a couple of questions of clarification. Yeah. So first thing is, you said the author of the Brahma Sutras is Badarayana, not Bhadarayana, Bhasa. Badarayana, yeah. Badarayana. The second one? Yeah. It, it may not be the Badarayana of the... Uh, Vyasa of Mahabharata. Because there were many Vyasas. One Vyasa wrote the Vyasa Smriti. Not Dvaipayana Vyasa. Eh? Krishna Not Dvaipayana Vyasa. Krishna, Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa. This is Badarayana. This Vyasa yeah. must okay. be a later, a later figure. Oh, he is also Badarayana Vyasa. He also has Vyasa as his name. Yeah, but wrote it, the may be, yeah, it can be the Badarayana tradition. Badarayana is, is a tradition of Rishi Parampara, I mean the succession of the ancient sages. So anyone who belongs to the Parampara, the, that lineage could be called like that. Yes. Yeah. My second question is the Kumarila Bhatta and the Pravakara, they are Puro Vimam Sakas, correct? Yeah, yeah. Kumarila okay, Bhatta so was the senior person who wrote Tandra Vartikam, Sloga Vartikam, his famous important books, which are very extensive. Uh, very well known works, uh, Kumarila and Prabhagara. Kumarila was the senior one, Prabhagara junior one. They were poor, 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 poor. They didn't recognize poor, the Vedanta. Yeah, wrote commentary. Yeah, poor, 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 poor. Hello, Swami. I um, had a question actually, not about this text, about one of your comments. I'd never heard that interpretation of the Katu Upanishad, that Nachiketa's uh, three questions were actually a sequence from the material yeah. to Bhajananda yeah. to uh, 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 Sachidananda. So it was like the, it was the three 
Yeah. I'd never heard that yeah. interpretation. That, that So he realized the impermanence instantly. He asked the first question and then suddenly had the realization that's impermanent. And then suddenly had the realization that God wasn't the highest, but it was uh, yeah. uh, Advaita. Yeah. Now, I, well, you know, if you read Shankaracharya's commentaries on, on, on Kathopanishad, you can see, you can, Shankaracharya himself says, for example, how Najigeda traveled from the state of the first born to the second born. First, you know, the stage, he said his father should not be angry with him. And as Chandra, he should speak uh, pleasantly, happily with him. It's from many. Chandra Sangha Pasumana. And his mind should be very pleasant because he had left his home without father's permission. So that was the thing. And then he realized that, uh, that Yama readily agreed, gave him that boon. So, and in the commentary, Shankarajari says, he knew that Yama, he had already a vision of Yama, who was a, a god, it means angel, more like angel. So, he, does, he won't have to worry about this material prosperity or pro everything will be secured because he had the blessings, the vision of that. But then, what happens after his death? Again, he had been born, he may be born in a poor family again. He may again struggle, he may, so, so what to do this? And again, he will be uh, bless, blessed with prosperity, all the great things in this life. But he, they won't accompany him when he, uh, when he dies. So he wanted, he thought of that. And then he asked for the second to be able to go to heaven. And then he understood, well, hey, what, does it, what, what does it mean? Going to heaven means? Go, enjoying the same prosperity and wealth, everything in heaven for some maybe for a long time. It's not also not permanent. See the Hindu concept, Vedanti concept of heaven, slightly different. You know, in in uh, Abrahamic tradition, gen in general, especially I'm talking about Christian tradition. That that's what I'm familiar with I'm, from reading. So, in Christian concept of heaven, you know, heaven. Uh, corresponds to close proximity of God. You are living in the close proximity of God in judo Christian tradition. I mean you are living in a place in, a, in the in the company of angels, the company of God. So there is a spiritual connection in the in the Christian Jewish concepts of heaven. But that spiritual connection is not the in Vedanti Mimamsa concepts of heaven. Just enjoy it. Enjoyments with, uh, remember, it is not uh, uh, Epicureanism or Bohemianism. Actually, they are very, Mimamsugas were very strict, very spartan, very rigid in their disciplines, morality and all that. But still they wanted to enjoy be, uh, the children, the disciples and all things like that. So Natsikeda understood that's not a big deal in a modern, using a modern language. It is not something mm -hmm. very, very profound, I say. So, mm -hmm. but what should, is there something that is eternal? And what's, a, what's my true nature? So, he asked for the third book. So, they said. So, if you read Shankaracharya's commentaries, you can see this thread, this connecting thread, this evolutionary ladder, you can see. If you read the Bhashya. So, that's how you understand. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I, I didn't. And when I've taken classes, I hadn't heard that. So, so that that evolution in Nachiketa's mind. So he must have been very bright it, yeah. within seconds to yeah. to realize the next yeah. step. Yeah. yeah, you know that, that yeah. Yeah. most of us spend a lifetime and don't get as far as he did in a few seconds. Yeah. Now, story, interestingly, it it is found in the Mahabharata and also in some of the Brahmana Aranyaka literature in a more primitive form. When Nachiketa accompanied his father into the bathing garden, the river, and, and he disobeyed, so his father, he go to uh, uh, heaven, Yama's place. But this is, uh, in Kathopanishad, the Krishna Yajur Veda, it is in a very poetic, it's a beautiful poetry, Kathopanishad is also very beautiful poetry. So that's it. Yeah. Pranam Swamiji. Yeah. Um, I was looking up the, uh, the Brahma Sutras, and uh, while I was doing that, I came across something called the Vedanta Sutras. Yeah. And it seems to have the uh, the same author, but it has a commentary 
Yeah. By Raj, Ram, Ramuna Rajuma. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Vedanta Sutras? I've never heard of that before. You know, Brahma Sutra and Vedanta Sutra are two names of the same book. I mentioned this oh, in the first okay. class. Yeah. See, Ved, see, Brahma actually here means Vedas or Vedanta. The word Brahma oh. and Brahman also used in the sense of Vedanta or Vedas. Bhavada Purana Brahma Samvida means equal to the Vedas, like that. So, Brahma here means Vedas or Vedanta. So, Vedanta and Brahma are seeing. So, that's us That's understand. Okay. It's the same thing. Yeah, okay. Same, same. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mark, you also mentioned that it had a commentary. Excuse Ramanuja. Ah, uh, yeah. Th this is just um, something I'm looking up in uh, yeah, you, on a, a library like, web website. Yeah. Yeah, you, uh, maybe, you, the, you know, it's called Sacred Books of the East. Yeah, I know uh, I, I, I know that. You see, in the Harvard uh, series of Oriental series, uh, the translations were all done in the early part of uh, the literary tradition. So um, I would always uh, suggest that you better read uh, the translations published in later times and uh, I'm not saying because I belong to Ramakrishna order, but Ramakrishna order's translations are supposed to be uh, more balanced and more accurate. Uh, not because others are wrong, but remember um, the Harvard Oriental series, the Sacred Books of the Lee East, uh, which was a great work in Max Muller, did a monumental work. But in those days, the resources for getting correct meaning uh, were limited, you have to remember that, it's an important thing. They did a great work, no doubt. You find many of the commentaries on Yoga Sutras were also uh, translated and published in Harvard Oriental series and Sacred Books of the East. But the point is, uh, the translations in those days were undertaken by great scholars uh, who worked hard with great dedication. But when it comes to accuracy, uh, maybe reliability, I would prefer that, I would suggest that you get it by some transitions from the Ramakrishna order. The other transitions also, they are mostly belonging to um, rather 20th century transition, uh, late 20th century, it's better. It's, it's a long book, the Brahma Sutras, it says here 880 pages, 800 pages. The one you are reading, yeah, I can know. Sacred books of the least in 19th century, Max Muller took up this a great work he did because he first he uh, he he brought to light all these great ancient works but later uh, more um, uh, dependable translations were published by scholars who knew both the original commentaries and also English mm. That's yeah. so okay. but their English may not be as readable so very often, you know, Indian authors, uh, in their attempt to be loyal to the text, uh, the language uh, tends to be more in, in involved sentences, you know. So, readability and directness uh, may not may have suffered in their attempt to be true and loyal to the original text. This frequently happens. Okay. Swami, I two, two things. One is uh, it, it, this reminds me that uh, I, I was reading Swami Chitnananda's new uh, book, Stories of Vedanta Monks, yeah. and he puts in there that Swami Sarvagatananda yeah. uh, of um, Boston had asked him to write uh, a Ramakrishna uh, uh, sutras. Yeah. So in that book, uh, Swami Chitnananda has his attempt at the Ramakrishna sutras. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, a. Yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> um, yeah. But. Um, I thought that was interesting, but but I did have a question. Yeah. Um, why are the Brahma Sutras considered so important? Yeah, one reason is it is a logical analysis of uh, different Vedantic statements, Vedic statements, Upanishadic statements, uh, using all the tools of uh, logic. Uh, so to understand its uniqueness, you compare it with the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad is a very direct interpretation of a text. Uh, 
without necessary. I mean, there are quotations from other books, but Vedanta Sutras quote mostly uh, mantras or statements from Upanishad literature. Then, I'll, of course, Mahabharata also you find. So that's important. Secondly, uh, all the other systems of Indian philosophy, Buddhism, both the Sautrantika and Vaibhashika, the Vijnanavadins, Sunyavadins, Puramimamsa, Sankhya, Yoga, Charvakas, I mean Indian materialist, all these ideas are brought in. And mutual, there is the, the dialectical discussions. So one may ask this question, why all this logic? The point is, if you ask the question, we should, should we read Brahma Sutras to realize God? I won't say you don't have to do that. To realize God, you don't have to read Brahma Sutras. But this is an ancient uh, tradition, a great intellectual tradition. Uh, in modern times, in my opinion, in this age, as I mentioned earlier, in this age of um, what you call a misguided uh, idea of simplicity, which leads to superficiality, which almost becomes a religion, you know. You should be very simple, straight. It means you just drink plain water and imagine you are eating wonderful food, you know, <laughs> really. So, uh, these uh, uh, great philosophical books should be revived, the discussion should be uh, revived and that may, it, it can have a positive impact on human culture, refinement, intellectual refinement, human civilization. So, one of the casualties of this uh, modern IT age is that you don't go for anything very serious or very profound. Everything should be simple, everything should be oh, just uh, right on your spot, and then you'll be okay. 20 minutes on Aristotle. You, you can have a video, or read a Listen to a video, Tundi means Aristotle, and you can imagine, you know all about Aristotle. It's certainly good. It does, it does serve a great purpose. But there is a hidden precipice, a hidden danger. I mean, Aristotle, the real Aristotle may disappear in a few years. <laughs> and this is, all the great works can remain unread and un, unused in the library, supplied to Aristotle. So these great books. So Swami, yeah. it, it used to be 20 pages. Now you just read a tweet and you understand it. <laughs> Aristotle tweets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it used to be you read 20 pages years ago, but now you don't even have to read 20 pages, just a, a tweet or two. Yeah. And you understand. Yeah. I, I, I don't think he would be amused if he reappears today and somebody uh, makes a tweet on Aristotle and says, no, Aristotle over. I have seen this happening. I, yeah, somebody puts a iPhone and quote where I start, and there's something. Well, everything ready, finished. I start. That's a, that's a big problem. I don't say everyone should do that, but it, along with other things, this also should be there somewhere. That's idea. It preserves an ancient heritage. Yeah. Maharaj, would you say beyond preserving the ancient heritage and uh, keeping the uh, balloon afloat, would you agree that uh, an immersion in the Brahma Sutra makes their greatness and importance and value self-evident? Evident. You feel, you feel it is self-evident. You feel, do you feel? Yes. Uh, you feel that beyond uh, preserving it as a great heritage coming from ancient times, there is it, its greatness, uh, spiritual benefit is self-evident. I'm very happy yes. to hear that. It's very rewarding to hear that, you know, <laughs> really speaking. Yeah. You would agree with that? I fully agree with that. I fully agree with that. Absolutely. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, I fully agree with that. You know, the, the IT age reduces your ability to listen to anything very profound for a long time. Because it makes you exhausted. Because you sit in the same place, do the same thing for 25 years, 50 years. So you, you don't vertically grow intellectually. Horizontally you remain the same stagnant ground. But if you study philosophy, 
I don't so remember it has its own value. It's essential. It's part of modern culture, modern civilization. We cannot go, go back to Bullock art age, no doubt. But these great ancient things also should be preserved. That's what I say. Along with IT and other things. That's what I say. Yeah. Well, this is just a comment about the comment that you had about this 10 minute video or 20 minute uh, video. I, what I thought is that. For example, I did not know uh, many of the things that you mentioned. Many of the authors, including Vajaspadi and the uh, book that books that you mentioned. So, if there were a small, let's say, a video or a version of it in YouTube, I would have seen it and maybe I would have had interest to read it. Now that I have heard from you, I, will, I of course have interest to understand and read this at some point of time. So, having such short introduction somewhere. Is really useful for people to get introduced to it and then get interested in it. Yeah. I think. No, that's true. That's true. What I mean, uh, that's absolutely true. What I mean, uh, YouTube and this is a great blessing to education, to culture, technology. Absolutely, no doubt. But uh, a cult of superficiality may emerge. And eventually, I agree. it may remove for all time. It may remove. Uh, the tradition of uh, going, making thorough studies of systems of philosophy. That frequently happens, you know. It is a trophy. Many of the human skills uh, get atrophied because uh, due to lack of, due to uh, non-use, just lack of opportunities for expression. Uh, for many of our skills, uh, mathemat mathematics, calculating, in my mental calculation, Memorization, traditional reading and learning uh, can get atrophied. I mean, you know, skills can disappear. This is the great danger. That's what I say. Not no, I, I, one I, I, year, but uh, in, in a few decades. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, the book by Swami Vireshwarananda. Yeah. It is the definitive Ramakrishna publication on the Brahma Sutras. Is yeah. there anything more? Later than that? Yeah, th that's an important work by Viri important work. You can, you can just, uh, uh, Ramakrishna Mission publication, then you uh, name any book, you type, and you get it. The, the Google you can get. You, even, you can even uh, use our own website. We have a very wonderful bookstore here, which uh, sells books on uh, not only on Hindu philosophical system, but Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, mysticism, and different traditions, you can find all books in our bookstore. So it's very easy to get here. Yeah. Yeah. Maharaj, it's very interesting what you said about the skills atrophying, the skills of textual analysis, but um, also the um, uh, tools of memory, tools of engagement with texts and traditions. Yeah. Very interesting. Because they they say that um, memory uh, use it or lose it, yeah. and uh, you know these these um, skills are even when they're taught they will atrophy without practice. Would you agree? Oh, you know I think so. No, the atrophy is a reality. It happens. It's true. It could happen. I mean, I believe. even children or students lose the ability to make to make use of their own mind. And certain skills and faculties of the mind can really get atrophied, especially memory, calculating things, uh, arithmetic, or mental level. It's a gift of nature. We uh, we outsource the gifts of nature to machines. So <laughs> we 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 practically end up being morons. This happens. But human potential, human, many of the human skills are not fully understood or made use of. Today we wonder how one can remember so many verses, so many systems of philosophy. So, but you know, because we don't, we have a very poor idea of what we actually are capable of. That's the reason. Yeah. Well, how inspiring to know that we are capable of it and uh, to see it demonstrated. My question, Maharaj, is uh, you've emphasized in some of your other lectures that 
like an intellectual understanding of Brahman. It's like it's necessary to eventually get to realization, but it can also be it can be a barrier if we think that intellectual understanding is the full realization. Um, so I'm wondering if like to me, like the Brahma Sutra, like is reading it when you're not fully prepared, when you're not fully ready for realization, could it be a hindrance to try to intellectually understand this book when uh, without sort of the proper training? No, you, no, you are right, you know. You see, uh, if look at, at what we are doing in this Vedanta society. Our Sunday lectures are not necessarily very profound in, I mean, in terms of the content, not as profound as the subject we are discussing now. Our Gita lecture that we, we have an on, in-person event in, in the Old Temple Auditorium, uh, it's more profound, more serious. This is still more. Now, you, you, what I mean to say, you are right. Uh, intellectual understanding is not enough. Depending upon intellectual understanding alone without any spiritual discipline really makes no sense. It can be an obstacle. True. But here what we are trying to do, we are trying to bring some ancient texts and discussing this. I mentioned earlier, we are not teaching meditation or prayer right now. We are teaching some ancient uh, philosophical ideas, which are part of our both spiritual and also philosophical heritage. So all these ideas are intimately linked to spirit, our spiritual life. So as part of our program, which is a bit academic also, you know, monks cannot always teach you how to pray. They should also... <laughs> We have to do something more serious also. There are, as you know, there are listeners, students with different temperament, different tastes. Some of them enjoy uh, more, more simple, more direct. Uh, that's true. But some of them uh, even appreciate these things. If, uh, so there are people who enjoy reading uh, Aristotle. Not that Aristotle can take you to God. <laughs> but even reading these great philosophical uh, authors, their works, it's a kind of, actually we are preserving an ancient intellectual heritage. And I can tell you very clearly, it has a refining effect on the human intellect and mind. If you go somewhere and listen to something sensational, uh, discussing something which eye-catching, like a, a advertisement for some, um, maybe something that you buy in the market, you know. Instead of that, something much more, which have preserved, which have uh, preserved some higher values. So it should also happen. I don't mean to say everything should go. This alone, everyone should read Brahma Sutra. We don't say that, <laughs> for heaven's sake. But this also has a place in the rich uh, heritage of human civilization. That's what I see. And that is very close. Yeah. When uh, uh, Mr. Eckhart was uh, was revived, his interest in Eckhart in philosophy was revived by Rudolf Otto's translations and his works. You know. It's a great sensation in Christian intellectual world. Uh, Eckhart almost disappeared. We don't know what happened to him. He lived in the 13th century. Whereas, Perhaps he was a far greater intellectual than even Augustine or Aquinas. Okay, they wrote, so he wrote in Old German and they wrote in Latin. But I mean to say, so what I mean to say, you know, so these great men who thought of great things, great ideas, they made a great contribution to the totality of human civilization. So in the 21st century, uh, maybe this is something that we can I don't. We, we, we can try to uh, make people remember about. Can, people can be reminded of this, these aspects of human heritage. Doesn't matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh.
ओम शांति 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 हरि ही ओम तत्सु श्री राम कृष्णा प्रणमस्तु